Greetings, theologians. Good to be back with you as we look at one final doctrine, that of eschatology. We are approaching not only the end of the semester, but the end of this journey through Christian theology together in a very basic sense. And today we are going to be looking at the doctrine of eschatology, mainly as not only a way to conclude the semester, but also a way to conclude this story through God's story, which has always been about salvation which has always been about the goodness of creation and which has always been about the salvation of that creation to restore it to its original goodness. And so for those of you in the NTS class, um, one of the, the extra texts that I have assigned to, to read this week is a sermon by John Wesley written toward the later part of his life called The New Creation. In The New Creation, you begin to get a sense of what eschatology is all about for Wesley and for the Wesleyan tradition. That eschatology is not about the destruction of creation. It is not about the end of the story necessarily in terms of a cessation. In, in particular, though, this doctrine for Wesley and for Wesleyans is about creation being redeemed, being restored, and being made new. And so then, let's go ahead and dive in. Eschatology is... Um, I mean, it, oftentimes thought about in terms of, um, of well, like images of death and destruction and apocalypse. I think for many of us, we may ha maybe have grown up in traditions or in, in congregations where eschatology, the word itself, conjures up all kinds of images of fire and brimstone and burning and all of those kinds of things. And certainly the book of Revelation contains those things. But those things in Revelation are always used for the sake of renewing creation, of restoring creation to what it has already uh, been intended to be. And so when you look at the things that are actually destroyed in the book of Revelation, it is not creation itself that is destroyed. Instead, it, it, are the, it, are, <laughs> it is the things that are, in some sense, um, making creation what it was not designed to be. Um, in eschatology, if you if you tend to associate it with a lot of images of death and destruction and decay, these kinds of things, those are the things that are making creation lesser than what it, ha it had intended to be. And so in the book of Revelation, what John sees in his revelation is that it is, it are, it is the things that are most unfaithful to that particular vision of newness that are destroyed. So if when you think about eschatology and, and you see primarily in your imagination images of destruction or death or decay, keep in mind that is a means to the fullness of eschatology. That is not eschatology itself. The decay, the destruction, those things are the way that God is making creation new. But eschatology is primarily about God making things new. It is the study of the last things. But there is also this sense in which the last things um, take this on this character of the fullness of things. So that it's not just that they are the things at the end, they just happen. It's that this is where creation has been going all along. This is the point of what God has been doing throughout this story. This is the destination for creation. And so when we study eschatology as the study of the last things, it's not just that they are the last because they happen to fall at the end of the story. It's that they are the fullest things. They are the, the teleological things, the, the aim, the goal, the place where creation has always been intended to go. And so for that reason, we're going to begin looking um, at Christian eschatology as the completion of the story. In other words, that eschatology doesn't happen out of the blue. It's not about God just getting angry and wiping a bunch of things off the face of the earth. Christ, Christian eschatology is primarily the logical and faithful conclusion to the story that has been written all along. It is the story that is completely faithful with the story of Acts chapter 2, of the Spirit descending upon the disciples who were gathered there and to, to gather them together as the church, even as there is diversity among them. It's completely consistent with the story of Jesus of Nazareth, the, the incarnation of the Word that is made flesh, um, the way that Jesus lived his life. It's completely 
uh, consistent with the narratives of Israel going all the way back to the time of new cre- of, of the original creation. So it's the completion of the story. It's not that God decides to just kind of wipe everything away. This is the place where creation has been intended to go all along. And if we can begin to adjust our pastoral theology to be able to do that, I think this is going to make some profound changes in the way that we tend to do our pastoral work. If eschatology is what God has intended all along, then the point of our pastoral theology is to bring people to the place of where God has intended them to be all along. It isn't just about fire and brimstone and those kinds of things, um, but it is about the way that God has designed us to be, being finally realized and made full in its fullest extent. Uh, It's not necessarily about predictions, timelines, or secret codes. And I know that for many of us who have been around the church for some amount of time, this tends to be the way that eschatology is presented. That if you can just look at certain books of the Bible and figure out what's being said there, if you can crack the code uh, and figure out when things are going to happen, um, that in some sense you'll be able to figure out what eschatology is about. Uh, You have you know, the pre-millennials, the post-millennialists, the amillennialists, those kinds of things. And if there's anything I could say about those timelines or the way in which things happen, um, it is to say, let's not miss the point here. The point here is that eschatology is completely consistent with the story that has been unfolding. So let's not uh, inject something right here at the end that is totally inconsistent with the system that has been unfolding up to this point. In other words, um, these predictions about the order of the way that things will happen and the way that things tend to to go uh, is not the point. It hasn't been the point of any of the other, uh, the, uh, any of the other doctrines we've studied so far. And so it also is not the point of eschatology. It's not just about predicting when things will happen. It's not predicting about how they will happen. It is more of a theological reality that influences the way that we are now. We're going to hang on to that for for just a minute to develop it more fully in just a couple of moments. But it is to recognize that it's not just eschatology is not just out there, a reality to predict, a reality to crack the code on. It is a reality that is breaking into our present time for the sake of salvation. And in that sense, the end of the world is more about its telos. The end of the world is not about it coming to an end. It is about arriving at its rightful end. So the end of the world is more than just death, chaos, destruction. It's the end of the world as we know it. The end of the world is its fulfillment, its completion. The things that we uh, would love to see happen um, to for creation to be renewed in God's image. And so this really is the heartbeat of eschatology, that it is the the telos, the completion, the goal, the aim of creation, rather than the cessation of creation, the way that it gets destroyed. Eschatology is not about the way creation gets destroyed. Eschatology is about the way that creation is made new. With that being in mind, um, this is a quotation for, that I love uh, from Jones's book. Um, eschatology is about a meaty, meaningful hope. And she means a lot by this. Um, that it is a hope, not just that it, um, in the sense that like it is pie in the sky by and by, but it is a hope that is breaking into the present. And it is about meat. Um, not, just, not just the kind of food that we eat, but about flesh, about real infleshed reality. Um, So here's what I mean by this. When we talk about a meaty, meaningful hope, we mean that it means something for our flesh, it means something for our bodies, it means something for the embodied realities of the world today. And it is a hope, not in the sense of, oh, you know, I, I hope that something will happen one day, but more in the sense of, I know that this will happen one day, and so I'm going to begin living right now as if that thing has already come to pass. 
sometimes I'll joke with my my students about this. Um, I'll, I'll say that uh, that when I'm especially lecturing in a classroom setting and um, it's a large class early in the morning or late in the afternoon in the siesta hour, something along, time, uh, along those lines. One of the things that I'll often see is that there are definitely students who are a little bit checked out. It's too early. It's too late. They're on the verge of sleep anyway. And I'll say, uh, Christian hope in an eschatological sense is not about you looking at the clock and saying, boy, I hope we get out of this class. Um, that is hope in one sense, but it's not Christian hope. Like looking at a future reality and going, oh, I hope we get out early. I hope this class ends. It's like, you know, like crossing your fingers going, oh, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope he lets us out early. I hope that we get to leave this class and go do something else. I say many of you are really good at Christian eschatology in the sense that, um, that many of you are participating in the reality that class has already let out even in the midst of class right now, that you're so checked out that you're either on your computer or you're already asleep, um, that you're practicing eschatology and that you didn't even know how good you were at practicing eschatology. It's kind of a funny way to say it, but that really is the, the difference of hope. For Christians, hope is living now in the reality that is yet to be made full. So eschatology has everything to do with creation being made new, but to allow that future reality from God to break into our present by the way that we are living as Christians, as followers of Jesus, to allow the future reality of God to break into the presence and to our present for the sake of redemption. And that is eschatology. That is the eschatological hope that it is hope but not just in a detached kind of a, a way from our meaty realities of life. It is to say, no, every aspect of who we are is being influenced, impacted, in broken by new creation, by creation being made new. And so it is for our bodies and it is for our communities and it is for our institutions and it is for our families and it is for all the things that are the meat of life. New creation is breaking in, and when we allow it to break in, that is hope. Hope is about being made new. So in that sense, hope is something where we, we recognize what it is to be in the present. Okay, so here is what it is to be in the present. And I don't need to spend a lot of time narrating this for you. You know what it is to be in the midst of a fallen and a broken creation. But it is also taking account of God's future to say that there is a future time mainly revealed to us in the dynamics that are narrated in the book of Revelation in John's apocalypse, where the new Jerusalem that we see there is constituted by continual praise and worship of the lamb who is seated on the throne. Um, and that we recognize God's future as that which is breaking into the present. And so hope is not just holding out long enough until the future arrives. Hope is actually opening the future to break into the present by the way that we are living our lives. So eschatological hope has to do with God making a future reality present in the here and now, the way Jones wants to talk about this, a stance of eager expectation is not to watch the heavens, not just to look up and and go, oh, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope we get out of here someday. It is to live on earth doing the work of the kingdom. So when we pray in the Lord's Prayer uh, on earth as it is in heaven, that is an eschatological prayer. We are asking God to take God's future, the way that things are in heaven, and to make them be real on earth, to establish us as that future reality, even in the midst of the present. So before we move on, I want to talk very briefly here just about what kind of a future it is that is supposed to be breaking into this present time. And I want to talk very briefly briefly about the book of Revelation and the vision of New Jerusalem that is given to us in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. Uh, this is going to be a composite view. Um, I wish we had the time to 
to um, do a fuller study on the book of Revelation. And if you ever get a chance to be able to do that um, with a, um, not, not just any study on the book of Revelation, um, but one that takes the theological realities of Wesleyan eschatology to, um, to their full conclusion and, and to allow that to breathe into the, the study of Revelation, I would recommend that you do it. But here's what I want to say primarily about the New Jerusalem. That the New Jerusalem is characterized by shalom, um, in that all of the inhabitants of the New Jerusalem walk in peace before the throne of the Lamb who has been slaughtered and is now seated on that throne. So the Lamb, let's talk about that for, for just a moment here. It's pretty clear, um, even though John doesn't want to make this explicit uh, by calling him Jesus, this is the one who has been crucified and resurrected. The marks of his wounds are still wide open to be seen. And that's significant. That means that the lamb, it's not just any sheep up there, it is the slaughtered lamb, the one whose wounds are still visible. And that says something about the kind of life then that begins to um, take shape in the New Jerusalem. Because the New Jerusalem is actually not just a city um, like we know them today. It is a cube that is given to us from heaven. The, uh, the measurements that John sees in the New Jerusalem um, are uh, uh, establish it as a, as a cube, not just as a square. I mean, it is long and it is wide, but it is also tall. And so it is a perfect cube that comes out of heaven and it comes to the earth there is new creation in the midst of this. The gates of the New Jerusalem are open, even though, and I think this is fascinating, even though the New Jerusalem measures larger than the known universe at John's, in John's time. So there is this sense in which the New Jerusalem is open for anyone who is out there who would want to enter into the New Jerusalem and have their life set according to the pattern of life that is... Um, inculcated by the slaughtered lamb who sits on the throne. Now, what's interesting to me about the New Jerusalem is that it is a cube, and so there is a spatial component to this. It's not just two-dimensional, it's three-dimensional, and yet at the middle of this, this city is the slaughtered lamb. So it's, I, I, I mean, Again, these images are not going to make a lot of sense. I mean, to try to sit down and draw a picture of the New Jerusalem um, is confounding. It, it's, I think in some sense it is, it is meant to be impossible. But yet in the very spatial center of this cube is the slaughtered lamb on the throne, the emblem of crucifixion, the symbolic image of God's breaking open to us for the sake of salvation, of God's own life being broken and poured out. So it's important that it's not just this triumphant lamb who is still has his body intact somehow. It is the lamb who has been slaughtered, and this is important. Why? Because it sets the agenda, it sets the tone, it sets the character of life for the rest of the inhabitants of the New Jerusalem. So the rest of the inhabitants of the New Jerusalem are uh, walking before, or um, this is going to be a funny way to describe it, but circumambulating around the throne that is at the center of this spatial reality called the New Jerusalem. And so in that sense, it's not like they're just walking on the, the surface of this. There is a, an, an orbiting uh, in this space that is the New Jerusalem which I think begins to signal to us that the New Jerusalem is more than a city. It is a universe. And the slaughtered lamb sits at the center of the universe. The new creation orbits around the slaughtered lamb in this signal to all of us that the new creation will live, orbit, walk, according to the pattern of a crucified lamb. So if you want to know what life is going to be like in the life to come, recognize that it has everything to do with the humble lamb that was broken open for us, who still bears the marks of his crucifixion.
And John sees that all of those who participate in the life of the Lamb in this way, to their martyrdom, to their death, to have their own life broken open um, because they refuse to be unfaithful to this strange way of Jesus, even if it costs them their life, are resurrected into this new Jerusalem, and they still bear the marks of their wounds. But now their wounds are not a mark of shame. Their wounds are a mark of victory, that they remain faithful even in the face of this incredible opposition that they may have faced at some point in their life. And so resurrection has everything to do with this reality. Uh, resurrection has everything to do with uh, what life is like in the New, New Jerusalem. But resurrection, according to the pattern of the, the New Jerusalem. And so... If, then, um, the dynamics of the New Jerusalem are the, in some sense, not yet, um, then we begin to, um, to ask ourselves the question, how does that not yet reality, that future reality where all of creation is walking in peace, according to the, uh, the way I'm going to refer to it probably a couple more times, is the liturgy of the slaughtered lamb. Um, to to move ourselves and do our work in accordance with the cruciform pattern of God's life, the sacramental outbreaking of God's life. Um, if we are to be that kind of a people, um, who, who uh, New Jerusalem inhabitants, the ones who who whose life is um, is in some sense um, formed by that pattern of the one who is on the throne, then we need to begin to ask ourselves the question: How can it be? That that reality, where all of the universe is walking in peace because they are walking um, around the throne in an act of worship, be already. How can that be the case? Um, the already. Well, he here are some ways I think that the um, the already begins to break in here. That God has given us incarnation, um, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. That in Christ's life and death and resurrection, the new creation has broken into the old in the life of Jesus. And so in some sense, this is what God has given to us to live out the new reality, even in the midst of the old one. I know that I've done this probably in this class several times, and this it tends to be one of my favorite theological places to go scripturally. But to think Christologically for just a moment here um, about Christ's resurrection, especially as it is recorded in John chapter 20, where Jesus comes into the company of the disciples who are assembled in the upper room, the doors are locked, he shows up and he asks Thomas, to look at his hands and to place his hand into Jesus' side. In other words, he says, look at my wound. I've been pierced here on the side. Place your hand into my side, and then you can believe. Um, there is um, something profound about that, because that mark of the wound on Jesus' side is the place where God's life was broken open. Jesus was pierced, and the fluids of life ran out of his body blood and water, the two things that are most essential for life. So we could say the essence of life breaks out here. It, it, it runs out of Jesus' body at the place where he is broken open. And to do this in a Trinitarian sense, I want to say like John chapter 20 is in some sense a microcosmic glimpse of what's going on in the Trinity during the incarnation. So that the now the place where God's life is broken open, i.e. the incarnation, the sending of the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit, is the place where God broke open to us. God's life has broken open to us in the sending of the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit and now stands open to us as an opening to say, enter in here. This is the way that you come into redemption. It is to place your hand into the side of God. And that wound has been opened precisely because the word was made flesh. Precisely because God broke open to us in sending us, not just 
a messenger, not just a prophet, not just someone who was um, like highly attuned to the things of God, God's own self. So Jesus is the place where the spirit breaks open to us. The incarnation is the entry point. The incarnation is the open doors of the new Jerusalem, the open gates to say, enter in here. This is how you can enter into the reality that has not been made full in a cosmic sense. There is a lot of not yet. And yet what we see in Jesus, there is some already. And we are given every permission to enter in by Jesus into the already of redemption. The not yet, of course, we recognize there is, full, there is war, there is famine, there is death, and there is oppression. We recognize that we are living in the midst of a fallen creation. But this is not to say that we cannot live as an already people in the midst of that fallen creation. And one of the things that I want to suggest um, to us about this life is, is ecclesiological. That the church is the eschatological, already not yet community. It is not yet the kingdom of God in its fullness. So we recognize, if you've been around the church, you recognize, hey, it is not everything that the new Jerusalem is going to be, where the nations are walking in peace and this eternal praise to the slaughtered lamb on the throne. And yet it is a glimpse of that, that every time that we gather together as the church, we are gathering together to enact in hope a reality that is still yet to be made full, but a reality that is breaking into creation precisely in the work that the church is doing. This is the point of the church being an eschatological community, that in some sense we enact the new Jerusalem now. We don't wait for the new Jerusalem to come out of heaven, but we say in the incarnation of Jesus, that reality of redemption has been made open to us. And as followers of Jesus, those who are being redeemed by Jesus gather together and we enact the reality of redemption that Jesus has opened to us. So if our worship looks like the new Jerusalem, not in its fullness, but if it looks like it, and if it sounds like it, and if it resembles the unity and the peace that is so characteristic uh, to the very core of what the New Jerusalem is, that's a good thing, because that is the church being an eschatological community of hope. Again, not like, I hope we get whisked out of here for salvation someday, but I live hope that the new Jerusalem is breaking into the world through the life of the church that has been gathered together by the Holy Spirit. One of the other things I love about John chapter 20, by the way, about 15 sermons I want to preach out of John 20, is the way that Jesus shows up and breathes on the disciples and says, peace be with you. That is an English translation of the Greek, which um, I know that I'm recording this uh, from the South, but I'm not from the South. Um, and uh, you'll understand it when you hear my accent on this, um, because the translation of the Greek there is really not just peace be with you as if like, oh, here's some peace, like hold it, have it, like keep it alongside of you or with you. Jesus is speaking in third person plural to that group of disciples. So what Jesus is actually saying there, the better translation is peace be among y'all. Okay. Peace be among y'all. And in that sense, it's not just like you all have peace to yourselves. It is may peace establish a relationship among you all to the point that a new thing has been birth. Now, here's what's so just good about this. Jesus breathes on the disciples. And if that starts to sound familiar to you, I hope that it does. Because it sounds a lot like what God does to the new human being in Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis 2, God breathes into what is basically a collection of dust. A lifeless collection of disparate particles that spring to life as the Spirit of God, the Ruach, the um, the breath of God is breathed into its body. And so what I don't want us to miss in this is that the church 
um, is being established in John chapter 20. I mean, certainly Acts 2, but for Johannine literature, not Lucan literature, but Johannine literature, there is something about John 20 where Jesus breathes on the disciples and says, peace be among y'all, receive the Holy Spirit, and have your life be characterized by forgiveness. And what begins to take place there is that a disparate group of unassociated particles, individuals, begin to be established as a new eschatological reality called the church in which forgiveness and reconciliation rule among them. Peace be among y'all. This is the eschatological inbreaking of what we have seen in the New Jerusalem that the nations walk together before the throne of the slaughtered lamb in peace, that there is peace among y'all in the new Jerusalem, and that, and that that reality is, is breaking into creation in the peace be among y'all of the church. So it is about receiving the Holy Spirit in that sense. And what does the Spirit do? The Spirit enables us to be an eschatological community. This is not something where you just like try really hard to be at peace. It's not going to be possible. This is a redemptive reality that can only be opened to us by the breath of the Spirit breathed out to us by Jesus. One last thing I want to say about this passage um, that's just so richly profound is that um, think about who it is that is breathing out this spirit. It is Jesus, of course, but it is the resurrected Jesus who still bears the marks of his crucifixion. And this is profound because it is the lung that was punctured that now breathes out the spirit that characterizes the life of this new gathering called the church, the body of Christ that is springing to life as the spirit enters into its uh, nostrils and its lungs. And that's important because it's not a uh, a spirit that is breathed out um, by an uncrucified Jesus. It is the Jesus who bears the marks of his crucifixion, who bears the marks of his being broken open, who bears the marks of his um, self-donation and self-giving to create an eschatological reality of a body that is prepared to be broken, given, and self-donated. So the church is eschatological in the sense that it stands ready as a body to be broken, not to be self-preserved, not to, um, to, to perpetuate its own sense of power and its own sense of reality in the, in, in the world, its own sense of kind of like hanging on to what it can get. But in the very real sense that it, the spirit that it breathes is the spirit that has been um, uh, colored I guess, by the marks of Christ's wounds. It is the breath that comes out of Christ's crucified body that we are breathing so that we breathe crucified air. We breathe, we breathe a cruci crucified spirit. And in breathing a crucified spirit, we begin to breathe, to, uh, to our heart begins to beat um, to be a crucified body, a cruciformed body in the world. And that is the way that the God's eschatological inbreaking begins to take place through the church. So the second part of this quotation here, um, it participates in the kingdom of God, making God's future present to a broken world. The way that I like to think about this is that, um, well, God is sacramental. Um, the, the God of, of Christians is sac sacramental. Um, the God of Christians is not self-contained, is not like, hold back um, as this kind of like unified whole that just kind of sends people out. The God of Christian faith is the God who actually breaks open to us. And sacraments then are the place where the brokenness of God meets the brokenness of creation for the sake of making it new. And the church is a sacramental body. It gathers around sacraments. You are initiated in the church, into the church through the sacrament of baptism. And by the way, um, what are the fluids that pour out of Jesus' body in his crucifixion? Blood and water. These are sacramental fluids. Blood 
for the Eucharist and water for baptism. And so the church that is gathered there, the church that enters in through the marks of Jesus' wounds, is a sacramental community that enters in through the waters of baptism and is sustained by the blood of Christ in the crucifixion precisely to be a sacramental, eschatological reality in the world. Um, that it is a, a, a community that is prepared to break open and to give itself away for the sake of creation being redeemed. Why? Because this is what God has done to create the church. And the body of Christ is always crucified. The body of Christ is always broken open for the sake of redemption. So this is the way in which the church is the eschatological community um, of God's inbreaking kingdom. We're going to talk uh, about eschatology a little bit more toward the end of the lecture today. Uh, but before we do, I want us to see this, uh, this diagram um, that we need to take um, a full account, I think, of the story of the system of theology that we have been examining together this semester, or the bridge, the theological bridge that we have been building. And to, um, in some sense, root eschatology um, into this, this story, to, to not let eschatology be something that is this bizarre addendum to the end that really doesn't make any kind of sense with the rest of it. And if eschatology has ever been perplexing to you, it's probably because it hasn't been rooted into the rest of the Christian story. It hasn't been systematically rooted into the rest of Christian theology or the biblical narrative. But this, I hope, will help do that for us. That creation was made good, in the fall it was distorted, and in the incarnation, a way is made to be remade good. I think that might have gotten cut off just a little bit there in the way that the the slide imported into the software, but it is to be remade good. So creation is made good, and eschatology is the act of making creation uh, remade as good. Creation was created good, and creation will be recreated as good. The fall is there to explain why it is not yet good, but in the incarnation, there is a way, a way has been opened to us for that reality that is the, es the eschaton to break into the present life. So I hope that makes sense. I hope that eschatology then is firmly rooted in this story, that, that God doesn't just tell a story and then throw a curveball in at the end. No, God has been telling the same story and enacting the same story from the very beginning of creation. And so eschatology is rooted deeply into that story by logic, and by theologic, by the, the nature of our theology. So what place does resurrection uh, play in eschatology? We have alluded to resurrection just a little bit so far in this lecture, but it's important for us um, to, to recognize at least this, that Easter opens to us the way for general resurrection. What do I mean by general resurrection? I mean the resurrection of all, uh, of all humanity. Um, I mean that resurrection was not just for Jesus. The Jesus resurrection begins to open the way for us to be resurrected. Because if we take seriously the diagram that I just showed you, the, the chart of the story, I think we also need to take seriously that if God creates bodies in creation, that God doesn't just um, dispel with those bodies when they become inconvenient or die, but that God logically and, um, and faithfully resurrects those bodies. And so um, what we see in Jesus is the first fruit, and that begins to be the content of the new creation. So resurrection is the way that we think about the way that you and I as human beings beings as creation will participate in this new creation by being resurrected into it, by, being, um, uh, by having that new life uh, brought in, into, uh, into real fullness. In the Apostles' Creed, uh, the basic structure that we are using for this class, um, keep in mind that we confess at the end of the Apostles' Creed that we believe in the resurrection of the body. 
and the life everlasting, that those two things go hand in hand. Um, part of what we've studied in, um, in our, our unit on, um, on Easter and resurrection um, and what we've seen in N.T. Wright, I think uh, is a testimony to this, to say that the resurrection is not uh, just something that was reserved for Jesus alone, but resurrection is what happens when you go through death. And I like the way that Wright talks about this. Jesus didn't just die. He went through death and came out on the other side. How do you come out on the other side of death? You are resurrected. Resurrection punctures the backside of death as Jesus goes through death. He enters into it in a very real sense, and he goes through it until death is broken. In other words, there is now no just endless backside to death where you just kind of enter into death and stay there forever. That death has been broken open. And we, as Christians, by participating in the resurrection, break through that death together. See, there were other people in Scripture who died and who came back to life. Here's the difference. None of them were resurrected. And I think Wright says this. The difference for Lazarus, for example, is that Lazarus died again. But for Jesus, Jesus didn't die again after the resurrection. There's a difference between resuscitation and resurrection. Resurrection is to be alive forever in our bodies, bodies that died, but have been raised to life, have gone out the backside, have gone out the other door of death itself. Um, in some sense, Jesus kicks the door open when he is resurrected from the grave. He kicks the back door open on death because we all know the front door. We know the front door very well. All of us will enter into the front door of death. And Jesus has now entered, uh, has, has exited death through the back door and, um, and has left the door open for us to be resurrected as well. And so finally then, the resurrection of the body points to the fulfillment of the story, creation to consummation, um, that it is a, um, a very real sense of, um, of what God is doing to redeem all of creation. A resurrection isn't just like this bizarre out of the blue kind of a thing, but it's totally consistent with God redeeming bodies, um, human persons in their bodies, not just allowing those bodies to, uh, to disappear forever and ever. So at the, uh, toward the end of this lecture, then I want to um, do a little bit of theological bridge building here and ask how can we connect the doctrine of eschatology to some of the other doctrines that we've been studying this semester? How, for example, can we connect eschatology to creation? I've alluded to this a little bit already, but I think the primary way of doing this is to say that, that eschatology is connected to creation in this bridge-building sense in the fact that eschatology is the completion of of creation and not the destruction of creation. The completion is not the destruction of, but the fulfillment of the story. And so eschatology has everything to do with creation. Um, one of the things I think fascinates me is th that the garden of Eden that we see in Genesis 1 is restored in the New Jerusalem. Um, it is now an urban garden because it's in the midst of a city, but it is restored. And I think that's profound for Christians to imagine that the garden isn't just destroyed, it is redeemed and it is um, restored, taken up into the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem doesn't, um, doesn't like say to the garden, oh, that's so outdated and I have no need of you. No, the garden is there precisely because it stands as a signal to the fact that this is the story that God has always been writing, has always been writing. And there is no need for us to say that eschatology means the destruction of creation. Um, eschatology and Christology. How is eschatology connected to and rooted in Christology? Well, primarily that Jesus is the fullest expression of the new creation in the midst of the old. He is fully human. And hopefully, one of the things you've picked up in this class so far is that to be fully human um, is, is not defined as being sinful or um, capable of sin. Fully human means that you are not defined by sin. It means that 
you are not prone to the virus of sin that is destroying your humanity. And so Jesus, as the fullest expression of humanity, as the most complete picture of what we get um, when we think of humanity, he begins to open to us that fullest expression, that fullest lived reality of human life, even as we look around and we see that most of life is characterized by a lot of unfull Christian life, uh, unfull human life, life as it ought not to be, or um, I guess the way we could say it is um, less than full human life. Jesus signals to us, and, and not just signals to us, but opens the door, is like makes real the possibility, full human life, even before we enter into the new Jerusalem. In other words, there that is God's future that is breaking into the present, is this full expression of humanity. Um, eschatology and soteriology. How are these connected? Because the way that you connect eschatology to soteriology is going to go um, a long way in terms of how you build your theological bridge. What kind of soteriology are you going to inject into eschatology? What kind of eschatology are you going to inject into soteriology? Let me, let me set up one structure here. If soteriology is basically about being taken out of the category of unsaved and placed into the category of saved. It's almost as if like God like picks us up out of one category and drops us into the other. Did you, you know, did you get saved? Um, you know, are you among the saved? If that's what it is, um, then what is eschatology? I think if soteriology is just about like taking, you know, a person and dropping them into the saved category, um, that soteriology I'm sorry, that eschatology then is primarily about where you are going to spend eternity in terms of like heaven or hell kind of a uh, kind of a, a mentality here. And what I have in mind here is Luther. Um, that Luther focused like a laser on justification. In other words, um, taking a sinner, a sinful person, and like taking them out of the the realm of uh, unsaved and placing them into the realm of saved by virtue of what Christ has done to justify you. Even though there's no change in that person necessarily. Um, Luther's phrase here was uh, simul justus et pe peccator, uh, which is Latin for simultaneously justified while also being a sinner. This is what theologians refer to as imputed righteousness in the sense that it is, um, it is not actually imparted on you. Um, it, something doesn't actually change in you. What is changed now is your legal standing before God. Uh, and so to be saved then is simply to trust in the merits of Christ and what Christ has done and then continue on as you will. Augustine was highly formative for Luther, and Augustine has a famous phrase that goes something like this, love God and do as you will. In other words, like you just, if you're saved, like you are among the saved, you are among the elect, you just kind of go on doing what you're going to do because you have been justified. And that is the content of soteriology, which means that eschatology has everything to do with where you're going when you die. Um, is it um, is it just going to be heaven or is it just going to be hell? And I think that is the, um, uh, the, the major part of that. But in a Wesleyan sense of soteriology, eschatology is about salvation. It's about being made fully human. It is about sanctification. And that sanctification is precisely about being made fully human, being even before we die. It is happening now so that that is breaking into the into the midst of the present. I'm running short on time here. Um, I want to be sure that we pick up this last piece, eschatology and its connection to ecclesiology. I've talked at length um, about the church before, but I want to suggest to you that the church is the place where the new creation is lived out in the midst of the old creation. In other words, when you gather together with a church, you are not going to church. Church isn't a thing that you just go to and you observe. 
church is the eschatological inbreaking of the New Jerusalem. A body of Christ that gathers together in forgiveness and reconciliation, that gathers together as um, the, the, the people who forgive one another and live out the peace that we see most fully in the New Jerusalem, well, that is exactly what is taking place in the church. That is the fullest expression of what the church is meant to be. Fully human people who are redeemed by God's grace, gathering together and living that out in forgiveness and reconciliation together to circumambulate the throne in the universe of Christ, to live out the liturgy of the slaughtered lamb in forgiveness. That is all the time I have for uh, I have for this. Um, I hope this has been helpful. I look forward to uh, a robust discussion on the discussion board as we continue this discussion on the doctrine of eschatology.